Welcome back to 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics with Applications to Web McMaster University. My name is Gapur here. We are going to finish this topic by regular expressions. So far, we've seen that each automaton accepts the strings that are defined based on some kind of pattern. We can say that a finite automaton is a graph-based uh, way of a specifying patterns. Given an alphabet like sigma, a pattern is a string of symbols of a certain form representing a possibly infinite set of strings in, in sigma star. So now we can talk about uh, regular expressions, which are an algebraic way to define patterns. The set of patterns that can be expressed in the regular expression algebra is exactly the same set of patterns that could be de described by automata. Like in all algebras, regular expressions have certain kinds of atomic operands. For example, in the arithmetic algebra, atomic operands are constants numbers like integers or real numbers or a variable whose uh, possible values are constants in regular expressions an atomic operand is either um, symbols uh, null and epsilon which represent empty set and empty string or a character from the alphabet or a variable whose value can be any pattern defined by a regular expression which could be made from uh, union or concatenation of two patterns or repetition of the same pattern for an arbitrary number of times. A pattern could be made uh, by a combination of these three operations. You could have something like um, you could have something like this: alpha plus beta, and then alpha star. Given that alpha and beta are both patterns. Um, we use parentheses again in the same way as in arithmetic algebras and define precedences between operators uh, to remove these to be able to remove these parentheses. The convention is that um, clean star that we show with asterisk has higher precedence than concatenation, which we show just by listing the patterns that we want to concat. And then concatenation has higher precedence with respect to union that we show by a sum sign or also sometimes like this. Um, okay, so you can define regular expression, um, regular expressions in general as an inductive set, which basically follows the same rules we, we just mentioned in the previous slide. Base cases would be the empty set and the empty string and symbols of the alphabet, plus um, definitions of union, concatenation, and asterate which uh, which have as input get regular expressions and produce a more complicated regular expression as output. For regular expressions, the value of each expression is a pattern consisting of a set of strings that we call a language. For example, the language of a character, any character from the alphabet like this one, the language of A uh, would be a single possible uh, string, which is A. And the language of epsilon would be the set which contains only a string, um, empty string basically, uh, or a string of length zero. And L of null would be null, denoting the empty set of, of the strings. Uh, we can have union of regular expression. Uh, when we know that uh, alpha, for example, is a regular expression, in mm, beta is a regular expression and then the language of their union would be the union of the language of each of them separately so if for example the alphabet is English alphabet and we have um, a uh, as an expression regular expression its language would be a and then if we have B as a regular expression then its language would be B and then uh, the regular, uh, the regular expression which we define as a plus b, its language basically would be, um, would be union of these two languages, which is a and b, and that is the set two, containing two strings a and b, each being strings of length one. A concatenation example could be, um, let's say that r is a regular expression. Let me just clean up this ones. So R is a regular expression of the form A plus AB. So union of A and AB, AB being concatenation between A and B. So the language of R would be 
A and AB. Now let S be a regular expression such as C. So we have S, C, and uh, BC, union BC. So the language of S would be C and BC, two strings of C and BC. Now the concatenation of R and S, so the regular expression that concatenation of R and S produces would be A plus AB concatenated with C plus BC. And let's see what is the language of R and S. So the language of these two would be concatenation of A with C, so AC, concatenation of A with BC, so ABC, concatenation of BC with C, which gives us ABC, we already have it, there's no reason to, there's no need to write it again, and then we have concatenation of AB and BC, BC. And this would be the language of the regular expression, which is the result of con concatenation of um, two regular expressions, R and S. Obviously, the number of strings in the language RS cannot be greater than the product of the number of strings that we have in the language of R and the number of strings that we have in the language of S. So now let's see an example of mm, clean star closure operator. Uh, so um, we, we call this clean closure operator or asterisk. Um, for example, having regular expression R is equal to A plus B um, without parentheses. Um, whose language is actually A and B, right? So now what would be the language of L R star. Uh, well, so let's just write it down. So the first uh, acceptable string would be epsilon, empty word, where where no occurrence of A and B uh, could be found. And then we have A, and we could also have B, where A and B occur only once. Then uh, we have two occurrences of A and B, which could give us AB, AA, and BB. And the same, so we can, we can write this for any number of occurrences of A and B. And, and uh, so the language of R star would be basically the set of all the strings of A's and B's of any finite length whatsoever. So let's see a question. Which of the following regular expressions matches the set of identifiers of a programming language? So names of uh, identifiers in programming languages could be a mix of numbers, uh, digits basically, and um, alphabet symbols, with the constraint that th those names should not start with digits. So take a few seconds to think which answer could be actually the right answer for the question. So let's go through options one by one and see what is the language of each of them. So let's see the first one. The first one is um, union of all symbols of the alphabet in both lower and uppercase form. And then the asterisk over them. So it means that it allows for every string made from like a subset of, of alphabet in either lower or uppercase. Well, that is okay, but it does not allow for numbers to be included in the identifier, which is, well, it, it could be in theory correct, but it's not exactly what we're looking for because we are looking for the set of all identifiers that are allowed in programming languages. So option was, one is out. There's also another problem with option A, and that is it allows for empty string and we for sure do not want ha to have an identifier which is actually an empty string. So option one is out. 
Let's see option B. It is, it extends the first option with uh, numbers. So again, we have all the alphabet in both lowercase and uppercase and also the alphabet. But again, also this one allows for epsilon and it allows for strings that are starting with, with a number. Basically, this would allow for nine. This would allow for nine A or many other things. And these two are not acceptable names for identifiers in programming languages. And that's why this one is out. The third option, which is not the answer, let me just not put that. So the third one is actually the second one, except that it resolves the problem of epsilon with using plus instead of clean a star. So whatever string that we, whatever alphabet that we have, the star, or let's say, let's define it like this. Sigma plus is equal to sigma star excluding epsilon. So when instead of a star we use a plus, that means that string epsilon is not allowed. And at least one occurrence of one of the symbols that we have here need to happen for, for the string to be acceptable for this regular expression. But still we have the problem of, of a string is starting with numbers. So option three is also problematic. So let's see option four. So option four is concatenation of two regular expression. One is all the alphabet from A to Z, again, lowercase and uppercase. And then in the second part, we have alphabet and numbers. So in the first part, we have something which is made from alphabet symbols. And then we can add other symbols or other numbers to that. And this part could also be epsilon because it's a star. But the first part needs to be there. So we are not, so this regular expression does not produce epsilon and it does not produce strings that start with numbers. So D is the correct answer to this question. Let's see another example. So which of the following regular expressions matches the set of words in an English dictionary that contains OAT, boat, or stoat? So you can pause the video for a second to think about it. So let's again go through options one by one and see what is the language they produce. So the language of the first one, let's write it here, is first of all epsilon because we have asterisk, so epsilon is allowed. And then oat, boat, Stoat. And then the next string that is allowed would be two occurrences of, of each. So that would be OAT, 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 or OAT, BOAT, or I don't know, BOAT, BOAT. So, so you see, we do not have words that actually contain these three, but we have only combinations of these three words. So for example, we cannot produce a boat and then some other thing here. It is only repetitions of these three and we cannot make many other words that contain only one of the three. And so that's why option uh, one is not allowed. Let's see what option two describes. So again, we have we have this part and we are allowed to add any symbol or any word at the beginning of, like before the combinations of old both are stopped. So that would give us words that end with some, um, some number of occurrences of either old both or stopped. And we can add things, other things at the beginning of the word, the string. But how about words that have something after that? So a, a boat A, for example. It is still acceptable because it has both somber, somber in it, but the other two characters are not both and they are both allowed. So, but this one, option B, only allows to extend and add new things at the beginning of the string and not 
at the end of it. So also B is not a good answer. And then what about C? So C has the same thing that, um, that we had at the beginning for option B, also at its end. So it's kind of is saying that it is in the middle and then we can have anything at the end, at the beginning and anything at the end of the string, which is acceptable because they are also star, so they could be also empty and the word uh, is not obliged to have something different from both so to note at its beginning and end because they have a star, so they could be epsilon. But there's one problem, and that's the expression that we have in the middle, which is B plus ST OAT. So the language of this, if we call this R, its language would be boat and it's tote. And it does not actually produce out. So that is a problem with option uh, C, which is solved here because we have epsilon within the parentheses, which concatenation of epsilon and out would be out. So this one has contains the three words and then combines them with other symbols from the alphabet. So the correct answer is D. So now let's see a formalized generalization of what we've been doing so far. A clean algebra consists of a non-empty set with two distinguished constants, zero and one, two binary operations plus and multiplication for which zero and one are representing identity elements, and a unary operation star which satisfies the axioms that we'll see on the next page. We usually omit a multiplication sign, that dot in regular expressions when we mean to concat to regular expressions and simply we simply put their names together. Clean algebra is named after Stefan Kleen, who invented regular sets and is formulated by uh, Cousin in 1951, who is also the author of the textbook we're using for this course. So what we put, we've been doing so far could be defined as a clean algebra over sigma star. So any subset of a strings that could be defined over sigma, empty set, set of only the empty string, union concatenation, and clean star over strings is an example of clean algebra. Another example is a set of regular expressions over an alphabet where those that accept the same language are considered equal. So uh, let's see the axioms that clean algebra satisfies. These properties are the same as those of ordinary addition and multiplication, so uh, these. In addition to idempotence axiom, this one, um, the last four axioms discuss uh, the properties of operator asterisk or star and basically state that a star behaves like asterisk operator on sets of strings or the reflexive transitive closure operator on binary relations. So let's see a question together. Which of the following is not a valid property of regular expressions? You can pause the video for a second and think about the options. Okay, so again, let's go through the options one by one. So let's talk about the first one. So we have said that asterisk in regular expressions always, the language of asterisk always includes empty string. And so the least we could say about this is a set that contains only empty string as an element. So this is not correct. And then we have this one, second option, which according to the idempotence uh, axiom of plus, this holds. So this one is correct. Then we have option C, which is true based on commutativity axiom of plus. So again, also this one is correct. And then we have option four, which is uh, like dot or concatenation between two regular expressions. And we know that uh, re concatting two regular expressions in with the different order would not end up in the same result. And so that is why this one is wrong. So, and the question is actually asking for those that are not valid, so the answer would be option A and D. 
So now that we know what regular expression is, we want to see if the regular expression and finite automata has the same power of computation. If we can show that for each language that is expressible by regular expression, there is a non-deterministic finite automata with epsilon transitions that accept the same language, then we can show that regular expressions match the class of regular languages. Why is that? Because we have seen in theorem 3 that for any NFA with epsilon transition that accepts a language, there is an NFA without epsilon transition that accepts the same language. And we've also seen in theorem 1 that if an NFA accepts a language, then there is a DFA that accepts the same language. So let's see how we can prove this by induction. We use a structural induction for this, but first we generalize a bit the theorem we want to prove. Theorem 6, which entails theorem 5, states that for a regular expression alpha over alphabet sigma that matches a language called L, there is an NFL with epsilon transitions that accept L, and it has one starting state and one ending state, has at most two transitions from each state, and has no transition from the final state. It will presumably uh, look something like this, the one that you see on the slide, but then for each base, uh, each case of the proof, we will modify it. Okay, so we start by base steps first, which are uh, the regular expression being an empty set, empty string, or any single symbol of the alphabet. For each of them, we can define an, F an NFL according to the characteristics described in theorem 6. The first one has its final state never reachable, so no string is accepted. The second one is accepted only if without reading from the input, which means epsilon, we are in the final state, and the string contains no more symbols, so it's fully processed and can be accepted. And the third one could be defined by adding a transition from Q0 to QF with the same symbol as the one in alpha. So now that the base cases are covered, we need to write the induction step. We want to assume that we have two regular expressions for which there is an NFA uh, with all the conditions explained in theorem 6, then if we apply union, concatenation, and a star on them, will there be an NFA for the resulting regular expression? So there will be three induction steps. One for union, one for concatenation, and one for a star. For the first step, we want to see if we can define an NFA for alpha as the union of beta and gamma, given that we have two NFAs called N beta and N gamma, uh, for the two of them, for alpha and beta expressions, uh, sorry, beta and gamma expressions. We can make an NFA for alpha by just making a union of the N beta and N gamma. So we use the two automata that we have already, and uh, the theorem asks for one final state and one starting state. So we remove the starting and final states of N, we redefine them as regular states, and define Q0 and QF and add epsilon transitions from the two new states to either of n beta and n gamma. So now we have a new automaton that accepts the same language as l beta union l gamma. In the second step, we want to prove that there is an NFA for concatenation of beta and gamma. And so instead of unioning the NFAs, we have to define an NFA that for each string processes both uh, both automata actually, and not either one or the other. So keep the starting state of n beta and final state of n gamma, and then add an epsilon transition from n beta to n gamma, and that builds an NFA that accepts alpha. And then in the last step, we want to show that if there is an NFA for alpha being beta star. So what we need to show or when, what we need to do here is to modify the n beta that we have already and make it iterative. So we add an epsilon transition from its final state to its starting state and make repetition possible. Then we add new starting and ending states and can connect them with, a, uh, with an epsilon transition to make the new automaton accept epsilon, which should be included in beta star. And so now we have an automaton that accepts beta star. And that concludes the proof, the three steps of the proof. So 
What we've seen showed us that if we have two languages described by regular expressions, each could be defined with a finite automaton. And so they are regular languages. Then their union, concatenation, and a star also uh, prove to be regular, as we've seen. So we can say that regular languages are closed under union, a star, and concatenation. We could also prove that the same thing for complementation of a language. If L is a language for which there is an automaton, then by switching all the accepting states and non-accepting states, we have a new automaton that accepts the complement of L, which means if there is an automaton for it, it means that it's regular. And for the intersection, we can say that we can rewrite intersection by using complement and union. Basically, we can write it as complement of L1. So if we have intersection of L1 and L2, we can write it as complement of L1, union complement of L2, and then union of the whole thing. So if L1 and L2 are regular, we've just said that their complementation is regular too, and we've shown that their union is regular too, and then again the complementation of a regular language is regular, and so by using the four definitions that we had before, we can also prove that intersection of two regular languages is regular as well. So we are done with the regular expression here. Let us see some applications of the things we've learned about. So finite automata is used in compilers to evaluate what programmers wrote is actually meaningful strings in the programming language or not. There is a set of tokens that represent acceptable strings which can be represented by regular expressions based on which the lexical analyzer of the compiler decides if the compiling program is acceptable or not. Uh, regular expressions are also used in text editing activities. When you define a regular expression for search and replace, for example, in text, then uh, that is transformed to an NFA, which is directly simulated. There are other interesting concepts about automata theory that we might be able to cover in the discussion sessions. Uh, one is building a minimal DFA from an ordinary DFA, meaning that they produce the same language, but the minimal one has the minimum possible number of states. So there is an algorithm to shrink DFAs down to the minimal possible number of states that they could have producing the same language. Then we have pumping lemma that describes the essential property of all regular languages. So it is used to prove that a language is not regular, but cannot be used to prove that a language is regular. Then we have uh, my hill narrow theorem that looks at uh, the different ways of reaching to a state from different paths and argues that a strings that are made from different traces of an automaton that reach the same state at some point need to be indistinguishable with respect to L. Then we have automata that have output tape as well as input tapes. So each transition not only reads from the input, but also writes something on the output. Uh, there are different instances of that, and if we have time, we will see a couple of them. And then we have more generalized implementation of automata, such as two-way automata, in which the header of the input tape could move in both directions and technically is able to reprocess the input symbols that it already had processed. Um, so video lectures on this topic end here. We will discuss more details in the discussion sessions. Thank you.